right. And we are live, live, live. All right, going live on the Sweet Peak Show. <laughs> All right. All right. This is always the awkward moment, just waiting for people to come in the, the room. Um, when I started like field of dreams moment where you're like, will they, will they show up? It was uh, funny when I started doing uh, streaming on Twitch and stuff, people always told me, you just have to learn how to talk to nothing because <laughs> there's probably not going to be anyone watching for your first couple of streams. Mm -hmm. And eventually people will start poking in. You don't want someone to jump in and there'd be radio silence or you just staring at the computer going, I don't know sure you want to still be yeah, performing to a room of, of zero yeah yeah and that's a it's a much different skill from recording screencasts like every i've recorded sure. a lot of screencasting courses and those are they're just very they're scripted it's like all right i know exactly what i'm going to say i'm going to talk about this this and this get in get out mm -hmm. uh with the live stream it's a lot of i don't know what i'm going to talk about but i have to keep talking to the camera and just keep that conversation going mm -hmm. um and that's a that's a much harder skill to develop but yeah a lot of strange improv it gives me a great respect for radio hosts and the amount yeah. of filler like they have to make sound really natural and and not not super uh you know static or super uh cl you know clunky so I you, agree. how has your experience been with twitch because i i've really wanted to start <clears throat> streaming on twitch and i know that it's doable and i know it's not that hard i just haven't been able to bring myself to like you know, get over the hump of learning about it i mean do you have any any tips or anything like that in terms of, of twitch yeah the biggest so the twitch community for live coding is really healthy and is growing healthier every day so more people are jumping onto it um it's kind of weird that Twitch is the avenue that people are going towards, but it relates really well to the whole uh, gamer culture where it's, and it's set itself up as, you know, not just gaming, but just what people uh, are doing in real life. So lots of makers, a lot of coders. Um, they like the easiest thing, like anything is just starting. Like don't put a lot of thought into your OBS settings. Um, okay. Or like if you watch Jeff Fritz's channel, I love watching Jeff, but Jeff's had a couple of years to kind of mature his, the, the fluff around his video and around his um, coding environment. So okay. specifically for, uh, for the stream, you watch a lot of these professional or more professional streamers. It's like they have these full setups. And I think it's real easy to get uh, analysis paralysis of sure. like, oh, I don't have this, I don't have that. Oh, I need a stream deck, I need a blah. Um, the 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 only extent that I took that was I bought a uh, I bought a green screen. So that's my green screen right there that's rolled. Gotcha. Up. Um, so I I have a good green screen setup, but I also am recording some new courseware. So I I wanted to green screen to try to make my um, recordings better because mm -hmm. I've learned so much from the streaming that I can make my um, courseware better because of the skills i've picked up gotcha so it's a that's a lot of fun too and um, I, I, one thing i haven't seen from folks on the the live streaming side of things is i know folks are doing live coding and i, I love that i love the humbling nature of that yeah like watching folks who who are gonna you know hack away at something just like i would hack away at something and these are folks that i've looked up to for a long time so I, I like that kind of democratization of stuff i mean do you do you tend to do a lot of live coding on a on a stream or or do you tend to avoid that i haven't done a lot lately just because i've had a really hectic client schedule um mm -hmm. the big thing i've seen that works well for people is just consistency so saying i'm going to be every tuesday wednesday friday or monday wednesday friday okay. um and there's like some folks uh like uh what's her name um like no op cat uh yes. she only records on sundays like That's sunday sweet, afternoons really. Mm -hmm. but everyone knows she's going to record on Sunday afternoon. So they're looking forward to her stream or mm -hmm. they might plan around her stream. Um, gotcha. So it really, uh, sorry, I'm 
getting ready to put something on. Uh, so there's a Reddit subreddit that's just called watch people code. Hmm. So, and I put, so I'll put the link to this up there as well. I'll, right. I'll put the Twitch link. Um, Cause I think those people that you can put Twitch or YouTube up there and it'll automatically embed on the Reddit uh, page. That's nifty. Which is really cool. Um, so post. And that brings in a handful of people. So it's usually not a big deal. Hey, I mean, that, that's great. Uh, let's see. My tweets just went live. Twitch community retweeted. So, yeah, if we get more people watching, that'd be great. So, all right. Well, we've been live for a couple of minutes. So if anyone's out there just watching, say hi in the chat. Um, I have a chat rebroadcaster that takes the YouTube chat, the Twitch chat, Facebook chat. And it brings it all into one place. So I can see all the chat. Oh, that's really handy. That's it, nice. Yeah, it helps a ton. Well, I'm looking forward to that because yeah, definitely interested in, in any questions people are gonna have throughout the you know, throughout the presentation or or uh, you know, any anything really that I can answer as far as that stuff goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have all these tools that I've just kind of picked up along the way. Um, Restream.io is one of my favorites. It's one I've paid money for. I'm taking notes. Yeah. So Restream IO lets you take one feed, uh, one incoming feed, and you can split it to YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, wherever you want to go, which is really handy because the more places you are, the more right. visibility you can get. Go to where go to where your, your audience is. Yeah. That makes yeah. Sense. And for something like this, uh, I want to be in as many places as I can be just to maximize viewership. Um, when I'm just live coding, I'll do Twitch directly. I won't, I won't live stream to youtube because okay. i don't think people are necessarily going to youtube for current live stuff right, that's um, the, they're seeking it out yeah no but twitch that's all you get is like you only go to twitch for live stuff so mm -hmm. that's kind of a better place to go you know i think twitch does let you i guess rebroadcast occasionally but it's, that's not the main purpose yeah. okay Makes sense. All right. How's the weather in uh your how's it, your Virginia Beach today, right? How's the how's the uh, yeah, today? it's a little little overcast. Um it's not too bad. I thought it was gonna be I think we're getting ready for fall. Like fall's gonna hit us hard soon. Hmm. And I was, uh, I'm not looking forward to the morning where I'm waking up and it's forty degrees outside accidentally. <laughs> yep, there's a I saw a thing a couple of weeks back that was like the 14 seasons of Virginia weather. Or yep. something like that, and we're we had fake fall, we had summer, and we had fake fall. Now we're in second yep. summer, and then I think you know, then it kind of goes away towards winter. So yeah, should fall off pretty soon. All right. Always turn on the YouTube stream on my TV in my office, so I well, make you know, sure you're up. And I live. was going to try to put you up on a couple different monitors, and I realized I actually relocated to downstairs because I haven't gotten the Wi-Fi repeater working yet in my upstairs. And uh, I realized that a solid connection would probably benefit us today. So yeah, that it's yeah. Better, better to do on the laptop with a with a reasonable connection than than a desktop with none. Yeah, every little bit helps. And like, I'll turn off my uh, my video so you won't have that overhead. And mm -hmm. <coughs> cool. I'm getting sick too. I can feel it. It's like I'm a day away from just being in bed all day. Start stocking up now. I tell you the. Uh, Whatever I, I have had, this has been with me for three weeks. It is the longest I've ever been ill, I think, probably in my life, you know, and I'm grateful that that's, that's all it is. But I, I think that like it is just stuck with me and I am I am very surprised Like I have rested. I have taken days off of work. I have taken the medicine. I have, you know, and, and nothing has helped so far. So hopefully the live stream will be the cure for what ails me is what I'm thinking. So. Well, I hope so. Uh, and we have someone in the chat. So Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan. Twitch. Um, Jonathan is always at every show, like without fail. Right. He is he is a top fan. Fantastic. It's great to have folks who are consistent like that because when you can depend on that audience or those questions and stuff like that, you know, one, you're giving value to somebody, and two, it's great to be able to have that that consistent audience there to give feedback and stuff. That's yeah. that's really nice. Props to you, Jonathan. Way to be involved. Yeah, you're you rock, Jonathan. All right. I have spammed every place I know how to spam. So if Sounds good. people don't show up, it's not for lack of trying. <laughs> <laughs> That's All okay. Right. I won't take it personal. All right. So everything, yep, everything's working. Yeah, I do this thing where I go through every um 
I have like two different, two or three different slacks. I drop it in. Um, I put it up on Reddit, you know, obviously there's tweets and stuff going out. Mm -hmm. Um, I can also do a rebroadcast on Facebook and say, Hey, come watch it on Facebook. And I know sometimes occasionally if I'm talking about Aka, the Aka.net folks will retweet it too. So we'll see if they've yeah they a little bit of a boost also. Let's see. Um, you are live on Facebook. All right. So let me hit share on that. Share now. I'll do some retweeting too. Yeah. <laughs> And we'll get started. Yeah, thanks for all the minute. promos. I know we uh, we had to reschedule a few times, but it's still oh. great to actually be here with you. It's it's wonderful. Thanks for all your your flexibility on that. Yeah, it's no worry. If yeah, um, no problem rescheduling. And then I had to reschedule. I forgot what happened on my side. Oh yeah, I've, I'm going through some client stuff right now, and there was a it, yeah, I think it was the Friday we were supposed to record and. It's, um, they basically said we need you here at this time. It's like, okay. all right. I, I know how that goes for sure. So, and so I'm used to most of my clients just asking, it's like, Hey, are you available? Can you do this? Mm -hmm. No. So we're, we're trying that to wrap up this project. Gentle than an ask that time, but that's, that what's is, that? That sounds like a little less gentle than an ask that time, but yeah, it is what it is. Sometimes you just need to be there. Yep. I'm trying to wrap this project up and just kind of clear my hands of it, but that stuff's taking time. Um, mm -hmm. So the joys are confusing. Right. Well, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and just we'll just kick the show off. Um, I am going to do a real recording of it. So hold on one second. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Swift Kick Show. We're not on our normal Wednesday schedule, but that's all right. We're we're here on a Friday, and I am uh, joined by. Sean Clean, how are you, Sean? I'm doing great. How are you, Kevin? Doing well, doing well. Uh, we have a couple folks out in the live chat, so you can always watch this show live. We're on Twitch, we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook. There's a lot of ways to find us, um, but you can get more information at swiftkick.in. But today, we, uh, Sean, we want to learn a little bit more about you before you start getting in and talking about Aka. Sure. Um, and I'm personally very interested in this talk. But before that, tell us a little bit more about yourself, um, who you work for, what do you say you do there? Sure. So uh, I, I currently work at a company called Excella. Uh, we are a software development uh, consulting firm in the Arlington, Virginia area. My role with them is I'm a leader within their .NET space and their .NET practice. I'm also what's called a managing consultant, so I supervise some other folks. I currently serve as the technical lead on our largest .NET project for a client uh, where we recently modernized a mainframe uh, to a modern web application uh, and that handles I think seven billion dollars or more in retirement benefits every year. So it's a plan where you're bringing pension plans across state lines and all of the regulatory and business domain complexities that go with some of that actuarial stuff. So I have a I work with a fantastic team at Excella which lets me do things like come on the show um, or uh, I'm in November, I'll be speaking at Tech Bash, doing a full day workshop and a few hour long sessions with you. I'll uh, be there too. Yeah, I saw. I was very excited about that. So um, Excel gives me these kind of great opportunities, um, but mostly it's nice because I get to learn from these fantastic colleagues that I have in the .NET space. Um, and Excel encourages me to be involved in the community and do that kind of stuff. So they're a real sweet shop, and I consider checking them out if I was you. Um, but no, yeah. very, very happy there, and uh, really appreciate getting my hands on .NET all the time. I've I've been around for a very long time, and Excel has always been a great company. The just people I've met out in the community um, always say good things about Excel. So definitely uh, one of the top companies in my book as well. So even though I have no no relationship with them whatsoever, I just know the people that come from Excel are good people. I am um, I have a, a thing where every year uh, on a certain date, usually around my birthday. I ask myself, you know, am I happy here? Am I, am I doing the things that I should be doing? Am I, do I feel fulfilled in my career and my objective? And I, I force myself to have that check-in and it's been nice that I've been there for three years now. And like every year on that date, it's just been like not even a concern. Um, very so nice. That's a kind of a, a rare experience in my opinion from other places I've been. So very, very happy to be where I am. Very cool. Yeah. Well, let's take a trip in the Wayback Machine. Let's go back a little bit further and tell us your origin story. How'd you even get started in tech? 
Sure. So I, I was lucky enough that my dad um, was a software developer. He was one of the, the early folks in, in the field, and he had taught himself uh, to program when he was working at General Motors, I think, way back when. And uh, he had taught himself to program and basically showed his boss a demo app that he had written, and that's how he became a software developer. And so uh, from that point on, he is a voracious learner, and I was a little kid, I always had a thousand questions. And so through his patience and uh, teaching ability, I sort of taught myself to, to uh, develop as well. So from the time I was a little kid, I was always messing around with some sort of code. Um, in my case, I remember when I was super little, he built a, uh, an MS-DOS prompt that I could play a game or something like that. And of course I'd gotten behind the scenes into the batch file and like reverse engineered it. And uh, my mom had called him up being like, Sean totally broke this computer. You need to uh, fix this. And so he thought that was pretty great. Um, and so both myself and my, my brother is actually a software developer as well. Um, he does more front end development at a think company in Philadelphia. And so, uh, but we sort of all grew up uh, you know, enjoying this coding stuff together. And uh, my mom, gratefully, I'm grateful that she put up with it all those years, us discussing code all the time, because she's not interested in that part herself. Um, but she used to call it getting trapped in nerd corner. So uh, she, oh, wow. uh, so I owe her a great debt of thanks for being trapped in nerd corner so often. But yeah, so I grew up there. Um, I went to undergrad where I decided to major in American studies and minor in English because I wanted to round out my skill set that way. But I also had a minor in computer science. And from there, I uh, was in the Pennsylvania area and I got a job opportunity to work for a consulting firm in DC. And I've been down in this area ever since. And so I found my way to Excel when I was looking for my next you know, big opportunity and I liked the way it fit and here I am. That's awesome. Well, very cool. So last and final question is that sure. so many people that we talk to, they're all very tech focused, but do you, mm. do you do anything interesting outside of tech? Any interesting hobbies? So. I do enjoy tech itself as a hobby, uh, way more than, than my wife would tell you that I should. Um, and so one of the things that I, I enjoy though beyond that is uh, we actually recently um, moved to this house um, where I'm broadcasting from now. And so trying to understand a little bit more about home ownership and get into that. And we also uh, just found out a little while back that we are expecting a baby. Oh, um, congratulations. Thank you. So my wife is due in February. And so uh, I'm, I'm fast picking up the hobby of reading everything I possibly can about this upcoming uh, tiny human being and oh, figuring goodness. out how to make that work. So, um, so that, that has become very quickly my hobby these days. So as a father of three, <laughs> my, my token advice is ignore everything you read. Um, Good to know. <laughs> because you're, you're, you're just going to get it. Like you're going to, you're going to have the kid. And like that first moment when you're holding is like, oh crap, I could break this. <laughs> yeah. um, you're going to, you're going to get over that pretty quickly and you're just going to, Love him or her. You probably don't know yet if in February, uh, right? We do, but we're keeping it to us for right now. All right, cool. No, mm -hmm. no one needs to know that except you. Um, you know, you'll know. It's like, uh, this is awesome. And, you know, the first three months are actually kind of easy um, because babies can't do much. <laughs> um, they'd wake up, eat, sleep, pee, poop. Um, that's, that's about it. Uh, when they start moving, then you start, then you start having some real fun. It's next and, level, yeah. And then you get to when they're like, my youngest is three right now. I like three is a horrible age um, because they're, they're learning how to like potty train and stuff like that. And it's just, and then I have a seven, eight year old who they're, that's when kids are finally useful, <laughs> but I can give them a task and they have an 80% chance of actually doing it. And so it's, it's a lot of fun. I yeah. love being a father more than anything in the world. So oh, I'm, I'm super excited about it. it uh, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a great, a great adventure. Um, you know, and, and besides, um, besides the impending small child, uh, the, uh, uh, in my spare time, I also really enjoy singing and musical theater. So I've done, um, I've been in a bunch of musicals over the years. Um, I haven't gotten into one recently just due to, you know, time constraints and things like that. But um, yeah. I can't tell today because I'm a little stuffed up, but I've done musical theater and opera for many years. So I, I enjoy it very much. I remember uh, Revolution Conf. We all went out for karaoke, <laughs> but we're not That's supposed right. to talk about that. That That's was... Right. That was a great time. That was a great time. So yeah, I, I, a little more professional settings. I, I enjoy uh, musical theater as well, but a good karaoke, I, I can't resist. 
Excellent. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, stop the questions there. We'll turn it over to you so you okay. can teach us more about the actor model. That, that sounds great. And because the actor model is something I'm very excited about. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And anyone out there watching live, uh, so we have a good number of people watching. If you have any questions throughout the show, just ask them in the chat. And I'll politely interrupt Sean whenever I can and ask your question on your behalf. If not, we'll just wait till the very end. That sounds great. So let's go ahead and talk today about Aqua.net. And I'm going to go ahead and minimize the screen here. All right, Kevin, are you able to see my screen? Yes, sure can. Okay, great. Just wanted to double check that before we begin. All right, so we're going to talk today a little bit about Aqua.net and the actor model specifically, which is the paradigm that Aqua.net enables us to, uh, to develop with. So today we're going to cover a little bit about why this matters, um, why the actor model in general matters, what the reactive manifesto is, and uh, how that came to be, a little bit of the history and overview of Aka.net, at least the rough understanding that I have of it, because I was not there for the creation of it. We'll go over some of the concepts and benefits of the actor model and the actor system in general and Aka.net. And I want to make sure I leave enough time for some coding demos to help bring those concepts home. So before I start this talk, I always like to thank Roger Johansson um, and the Aqua.net folks at Petabridge as well. Um, Roger is uh, someone who had developed, I believe, a lot of the graphics that you're going to see in this presentation, and he kindly let me completely copy them um, because I thought they'd really bring home some of the concepts well. And so I like to put his information up at the beginning of this talk just to make sure that everyone knows one that he's a great resource for the actor model and Akka in general he also i believe created a new actor model uh, tool called uh, proto actor so definitely check that out as well but he's a, a great guy and a great resource <clears throat> i also like to post uh, this before i get started on the talk because roger being an incredibly bright developer who i rely on the library that he co-created um, he like many other senior developers, has trouble with things from time to time. And so I always appreciate his uh, candor around uh, things that he is able to or unable to do, um, because I think we've all felt this way one way or another. So little just that encouragement to you folks out there who might be newer. Um, we all feel like this on some days, so don't ever let that get you down. I also, um, as I mentioned, Petabridge is a, a company um, started by Aaron Stannard, um, who is uh, a fantastic member of the .NET community. He recently actually gave a talk at .NET Conf on the actor model and Aka.NET and when actors might be useful. So Petabridge is a company that does training and helps with implementation for Aka.NET and the actor model. They have some great resources in terms of uh, some boot camp materials that will get you started with some emails occasionally and that will let, allow you to uh, get some of the content under your belt for uh, the actor model and Aka.net. So they've got a great website. Um, Aaron is, is very active on Twitter and very responsive. There's also a Gitter chat for Aka.net. Um, I don't have the link up here, but I can always send that out afterwards. So there's a pretty active community around Aka and Aka.net, both on GitHub and in various chat forums uh, on the web. Uh, we already talked about Excella, so I'll skip over this slide, but I'm a big fan of Excella, and I think you would be as well. The .NET Foundation. Um, for folks out there on the stream who haven't heard about the .NET Foundation, it's an organization uh, that I feel incredibly passionately about. Uh, the .NET Foundation recently elected a board of directors, and uh, they've been making some great strides on trying to figure out how to make .NET uh, a better place in the community, how to make it more prevalent for folks who maybe are learning to develop for the first time, or who uh, maybe don't have as much access to development materials. They've been doing a lot of work around how to position .NET as a fantastic open source ecosystem. It's, uh, you can become a member of the .NET Foundation if you've made any kind of um, contributions to the .NET area, and the, they try to keep the bar for that pretty low. So if you're interested in applying to become a member of the .NET Foundation, which means you can vote in the elections, and you can get involved in an action team to help do some of these outreach efforts, feel free to check out the .NET Foundation and their website website or see me for more questions. I'm a big fan of them. And they are an independent organization separate from Microsoft. Um, so they help steward the .NET open source community. And I'm a big fan of them. 
All right, this is me. Um, I'll have my contact information up at the end of this talk, so I won't spend too much time, but I'm always happy to hear from you, whether that's uh, via email or GitHub or Twitter um, or any, you know, on my website, I'm blogging a bunch these days. I recently did a series on better technical interviews that you can feel free to check out, but that's me, I'm Sean, hello. All right, so let's talk a little bit about why the the actor model and Akka.net matters. Why this uh, is gonna have an impact for you as, as a developer. So back in the, uh, you know, back in the older days of web development, we used to be able to take you know, many seconds to deliver a request, or we used to be able to uh, have errors, right? And it was kind of just the way that the old clunky web worked. And these days our users expect more. Our users don't allow for, for you know, many second load times. They're gonna to go to a different application. Our users don't have as much of a tolerance for faults as uh, maybe they once did. And so the reactive manifesto sort of came about to essentially say that we as developers need to evolve with our users' expectations. Our users expect real our users expect real time information. They expect real time processing. They expect zero downtime. They expect errors to be non-existent. They expect a quality experience, both from the web and, and from whatever applications they may be doing, whether that's at scale. I mean, how many times have we heard about uh, you know, massive multiplayer systems, right? And the problems that could come up if they happen to go down. Um, and so you have these systems that have evolved like Halo, which relies actually on, I believe, Orleans, which is Microsoft's uh, Microsoft library that also helps implement the actor model. So the reactive manifesto came about to sort of define some things about what makes a reactive system and why does it matter? So reactive systems are responsive. That means they're gonna be giving you a response quickly, uh, no matter what kind of scale you're gonna need from that system. So whether you're running it on you know, one machine or a hundred machines or whatever load you're running it on, reactive systems should be responsive. Reactive systems are resilient. That means that they can recover from failure and there's a fault handling mechanism built into reactive systems. And that's to make sure that no matter what happens or whatever uh, component of your application may have an issue or, or become unresponsive or unreliable, your application as a whole remains resilient and able to deliver value to your users. Reactive systems are elastic. What that means is that uh, they, as I mentioned, can scale as needed. So if you need, you don't have to provision 100 servers if you only need one, you should be able to burst out your actor system to as many machines as you need. And then you should be able to, uh, to claw that back when you, when you don't need as many resources. So reactive systems are built in such a way that allow us to have that elasticity both vertically and horizontally across, uh, across your, your overall uh, topology of your system. And lastly, reactive systems are message driven. What we mean is that information in reactive systems is exchanged by the passing of messages back and forth. So uh, if you are working with, between, between components in a reactive system, you are going to be passing messages back and forth. And I should mention this is different than, um, than uh, you know, rx.net or different than that paradigm. This is sort of the idea of a reactive system overall. Um, so I like to distinguish that a little bit to start out. So because we have those resilient and elastic systems, they're gonna be flexible. You're gonna be able to deploy them in a number of different ways and scale pieces of them independently because they're loosely coupled. They are systems that are passing messages back and forth. And beyond that, they don't necessarily have to know the inner workings of those other components. And as a result of that, because they're sort of, you know, they've got that, uh, that functionality encapsulated in these smaller pieces, they're also scalable. You can scale one piece out uh, to be uh, an incredible amount of, of throughput and you can scale another piece down as needed. Act, uh, reactive systems and systems built with the actor model are easier to change. Um, when you need to change the way one component works, you can very easily suggest that it will take in a message or a new version of a message, and it will react um, in a slightly different way. And those components are very small, which means that their, their footprint in terms of the change or what I call the blast radius of those kinds of changes, and tends to be pretty small. Reactive systems are fault tolerant. And what that means is if you think about a system um, that is a hierarchy of things, and we'll show a diagram of this in a little bit. A system is able to have many, many points 
to recover correctly when something goes wrong and still deliver an appropriate response to the user. Um, so if a component fails sort of lower in that hierarchy, its parent has the ability to try to fix the situation. And if that doesn't work, then that component's parent has the ability to try to fix the situation all the way up that, that chain. And so as a result, these systems are fault tolerant or what we sometimes call self-healing in a lot of cases. They can figure out what goes wrong, actually adjust their behavior and heal themselves in real time. And reactive systems also tend to be really fast in support of that responsive uh, nature of things. So they are very small components that reside in memory that are passing messages around. Um, and as a result, they tend to be able to deliver a response very quickly, or they are able to uh, scale very quickly uh, when under load to still remain fast and resilient. All right, so that, that's reactive systems in general, but we're gonna talk now about an overview of Akka.net in particular. So the actor model as a concept is actually not new at all. Um, normally when I do this for a live audience, I ask folks to sort of call out when they think the actor model may have came into being as a paradigm. Um, but really, I believe it's Carl Hewitt published the paper on the actor model uh, and the definitions of the actor model in I believe it was 1978. So this concept actually has been around for some time. And we're only recently catching up because the business constraints of what we're doing are really forcing us to make sure that we're thinking in these paradigms for resiliency and responsiveness. But the concept of the actor model itself is not new at all. So actors are used in a variety of places. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Erlang programming model, that is highly based on an actor-like representation. There's this pattern called the fault kernel pattern where you have parents and children, and uh, if something goes wrong with a child, the parent can recover, and the, those components are built into those hierarchies. So if you're familiar with that uh, sort of paradigm, this will likely not be or not seem so new to you. Also, um, actor models, uh, I mentioned the, uh, the Halo system online and many other uh, multi, you know, massive online games um, are using the actor model behind the scenes because that's what's allowing them to operate efficiently at this giant cloud scale when you're dealing with all sorts of things that are happening in a large universe. There's also, and I believe the actor model is used, uh, I want to say it linked in as well. Um, in addition to the graph, I believe they were also doing some stuff with the actor model. Um, and also, I believe Twitter uses the Java version, um, Akka, for a while to do some of its stream processing, though that was a little while ago, so they may have uh, evolved to something new since then. But for a long time, if not still, they were also using the actor model. So you're finding the actor model in these different kind of systems of large scale or large resiliency, or where that sort of uh, mission critical aspect of software development tends to be important. Um, on my current client, we're actually, we utilize the actor model in Akka.net to break a very long synchronous process into something that we could do a lot more in parallel um, without having to worry about losing some of the safety or having a lot of um, high, what I call cognitive overhead or understanding of the system. Um, we'll talk about how Akka.net sort of helps guide us in that way. But so we're using that in production and we took an hours long operation and reduced it to minutes. Um, and so we've had some great impact there using Akka.net for ourselves, just in some of our larger processing patterns that we actually have. Okay, so in comes the idea of Akka and Akka.net. So Akka has existed in the Java world for some time. I believe it began as a Java project. And so what happened is both, uh, and this is where I'm sort of a loose historian here. So Aaron or Roger, if you hear this, feel free to correct me if I'm getting it wrong. But I believe that the Akka folks, um, sort of Aaron and Roger, um, we're both working on this problem in parallel. Um, and the way Aaron tells the story, he was working at a, pro, uh, a, a company called Martup Analytics that he'd founded. And they were trying to do some things where, you know, when a user took you know, one, two or three actions uh, in, in a certain sequence, then maybe they would offer someone a, a promotion code or something like that. 
And so they were trying to do this via HTTP and SQL Server. And of course, the unreliability of the network meant that these messages weren't coming in in a reliable manner. And even when they did, there was such an influx of them that it was actually just completely bricking their SQL Server and, and it was falling over in pain. And so uh, Aaron was sort of thinking about, OK, uh, I have to redo this. And he finally settled on, um, he finally was able to Google the name of the problem that he had, which was he had a, I believe he had a stateful, um, a, an in-memory stateful distributed systems problem. And once he was able to Google that and, uh, and get there, he, he found Akka. And he said, this is exactly what I need, the actor model for distributed systems. But his product was in .NET and Akka was in Java. So he had two choices. He could move his company's entire product to, uh, to the JVM, or he could port Akka, dot, uh, or he could port Akka to .NET. Um, and along those lines, uh, Roger at the time was also working on porting it to .NET. They synced up and then Akka.NET was born. And thankfully, the folks from the Akka project were really helpful throughout the entire thing. And even in the end, allowed them to adapt um, the name of Akka um, for themselves. So now we've got Akka and Akka.NET, which are two separate code bases, um, but they came about and they share a common goal of bringing that actor model to a larger scale and a larger audience. So some concepts of the actor model, you know, what are the terms and, and tools and the ways that we need to shift our thinking about software development in terms of the actor model? So in object-oriented programming, when we think about in C Sharp or in Java, the idea that everything is an object, right? Everything is uh, you know, an object that has properties or fields or methods. In the actor model, we can think of that unit of functionality as an actor. And an actor is sort of like an object on steroids. It has, it's got a lot more going on than an object and it's got some, some functionality built in, some basic concepts. So when you're working with something uh, in Akka.net, rather than thinking about, I'll create a new object, you'll generally be working with an actor um, always. So the base unit of work is an actor class. An actor encapsulates behavior. And what that means is that an actor uh, receives a message and we'll talk about how it does that in a little bit. An actor receives a message, it can process something and it can change its internal state or it can send additional messages to its children or to another actor. Uh, and that's, that's about it. But an actor encapsulates that behavior. And so it, it receives messages and then it either executes that behavior or it uh, sends messages to another actor or sometimes it does both. So but that behavior and that functionality is encapsulated within an individual actor. For those of you who are not familiar with the concept of immutability, um, Akka.net really relies heavily on the concept of immutable messages. So what we mean there is that once you have created this message class, you don't change anything about it. So any properties that it has are read only and you pass everything in that you need, generally speaking, in the constructor. And the reason for that is that these messages get passed all over the system to different actors. And so it's incredibly important that the contents of that message not change mid-flight and that we sort of be able to reason about the systems. And so as a result, whenever you see us using messages, they'll be immutable messages. So once we create them, we don't ever change anything about them. If we need to change something, we create a brand new message and we populate that. And so the concept of immutable messages is, is very important in Akka.net. And we'll see some examples of that later. So a really important concept in the actor model is the idea that we work with actors by reference. What I mean by that is that you're not going to say, uh, you're not going to pull back um, an actor object. You're always going to talk to an I actor ref. Uh, or an interface that represents the location of an actor. This enables something called location transparency, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But the idea is that you, as an actor, don't need to care where other actors live. You rely on the actor framework, in this case, Akka.net, to route those messages to the appropriate place. You just get yourself a reference to that actor. And that's because behind that actor reference, maybe there's one actor on your system, 
Maybe the actor lives on another server entirely. Maybe that actor is actually a router that holds 25 actors that process things in a round robin fashion. The key though, is that your application doesn't have to know about that. So you only ever work with an actor using an I actor ref or a reference to an actor rather than an actual actor object itself. There's a concept of props in the actor model. When I first heard about props, I thought, oh, are these like the properties of an actor model or the properties of, of some part of the system? But it's really kind of a joke about actors. Actors need props to do their job. And so props are the idea of here's how we instantiate an actor, right? We pass it its props and then it goes off and does its thing. So we'll show an example of props, but you can think of props as sort of the code that tells us how to initialize or create an actor. And the reason why we pass these around separately is so, and you'll see this in a little bit, so that we can create remote actors on other systems, even if those other systems don't know about our actors. Right? And that sound, might sound a little vague, but we'll, we'll show that in action during this talk. So every actor has a couple of, um, you know, we mentioned that in the ACA.NET model, the actor model, the unit of work is an actor. And so every actor has certain things about it that make it an actor. The actor has an address that lives, uh, that tells us where it lives within an actor system, and whether it's a certain machine or a certain hierarchy within that system. So every actor has an address where it is located overall in the system. Every actor has a context. And what that means is that actors don't sort of exist in a vacuum. You have to create an actor within a hierarchy. So you have to, if you have a top level actor, it's beneath the, system, uh, the user level hierarchy. And if you create a child, that child actor is created in the context of its parent actor. So what we mean here is that actors don't really operate independently. They, are all, they always exist in a hierarchy and that's, that's by design because every actor has the concept of supervision, which is to say, when one of my child actors has something happen that shouldn't, whether an exception was thrown or something has gone wrong, I already have a plan in place about what should happen when that happens. And that's called supervision. So the idea is that maybe I say, and we'll talk about this a little bit later with a graphic, but maybe we say, oh, um, this child actor had a problem and it threw an exception. Okay, parent actor, what's your supervision strategy? And the parent actor says, oh, whenever that happens, I wanna restart that child actor and keep processing messages, but forget about that one particular message. Okay, we can do that, right? And so this concept of supervision is built into every single actor so that we can kind of get that resiliency all the way up the hierarchy. Every actor has a mailbox. What we mean by that is that every actor receives messages. And a key concept in Akka and the actor model is that you receive, every actor receives one message at a time. So we don't have to worry about things like uh, dealing with async and parallel programming in a lot of cases, because you can really easily reason about your actors because they will only ever receive one message at a time and they'll do something in response to that message. And so as a result, you know, they're taking the first message out of the mailbox. But an actor, if I ask an actor to do a thousand things at once, it'll queue up a thousand messages in that mailbox. And then the actor will take in those messages in a first in first out manner. Also, every actor has a life cycle. So if you are working with the actor model, um, every actor has a life cycle where you can hook into the pre-restart event for an actor or the post-restart event. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about what that life cycle is and what some of those events are in the coming slides. All right, so first let's talk about addressing. So there are different parts of uh, address in Akka.net, but this is, where, this is where the address of the actor is. So the first part of the actor model address is the protocol that you're using to connect. Uh, generally speaking, it's TCP, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so this is an example of where we're saying, okay, we're gonna connect using the Akka.tcp protocol. And that's what you get out of the box with Akka.net. The next piece of the, uh, the, uh, the address is the actor system that you're operating in. Now this is the system that you give it, uh, you give this system a certain name. And that's to make sure that actors can only talk to other actors within the same actor system. So you may have actors on three different machines, uh, but if they all have share this system name and they have the remoting enabled, which we'll demo in a little bit, they can actually talk to each other across those system boundaries.
But the key there is naming the system the same. If I have a system called my system one and another system called my system two, those actors aren't going to be able to talk to each other in the way that we'll demonstrate during this talk. The next piece of the address is sort of where this actor lives. And in this case, this actor system lives at localhost on port 8080. So it, li it would live on my local machine at port 8080. But you might be able to refer to an actor on a different machine at a different port. Um, but that's to say that this address, this part of the address is the actual machine and port where that, um, where that actor system lives in this case. And the last piece of the actor address is the path. So here, what you see is user slash hello world actor. We'll show a diagram of this in a second, but in Akka.net, there is a root actor. And then underneath that actor, there are two other actors. One is the system actor and one is the user actor. Every actor that you create will live below the user hierarchy. And so in this case, what we're looking at is a top level actor called the hello world actor that I have created uh, right under the user hierarchy, so at the top level of the hierarchy from, from my perspective as a developer. So there can, this, this path can be as long as you want. If my hello world actor had a child called my child, then the path would be user slash hello world actor slash my child. All right, every actor, oh, fortunately it looks like this may not be as centered as I thought it was, but let's see if I can do that. Okay, so every actor has a life cycle. So when we create a new actor or when we replace an existing actor with a new instance, what the first thing that happens is that pre-restart is called on the old instance, right? And then uh, the instance is then restarted. Uh, and then the new instance replaces the old instance. And then post-restart is called on the new instance. And then eventually you can resume processing and resume is called. Okay, so what happens here is that we're saying that an actor can live at a, you know, just because there's an actor at an address doesn't mean it's always the same actor. If an actor needs to be restarted, it can be replaced with a new instance. If we need to restart that actor with um, a parent that has 25 other actors behind it transparently, we can do that. And we can hook into these events to do things like, for example, make sure that we don't drop any messages on a restart. So in our pre-restart method, we might want to say, hey, stash any incoming messages so that they don't go away. And then in our post-restart method, we might want to say, oh, go ahead and unstash those messages so that I can continue processing them. And then we can resume normal processing. So this is just to say that there are these hooks that you can call into for your own purposes, and the framework makes use of them as well to help you build these resilient systems. All right, so let's talk a little, oops, let's talk a little bit about context. So the way this works, and this is one of those great graphics by Roger that helped drive some things home for me. So there's an actor ref somewhere in the world. And that message, that actor ref is passing a message through a transport system. We mentioned TCP earlier, but there are several available. So it comes through some transport system into what's called an event-driven thread. Now, it's important that this is an event-driven thread. What we mean by that is that Akka isn't polling all the time to say, oh, do I have a new message? Do I have new stuff to take in now? It, an actor is only active when a message is being pushed into its mailbox. Other than that, they're actually not that chatty and they don't take up that many resources because they're not constantly polling for new messages to process. So a message will come in via that transport and it will come into the actor's mailbox. Once it's come into that actor's mailbox, that what happens is up to the actor. So maybe an actor will have certain behavior that it enacts. Maybe the actor will change some of its in internal states some variables or some stuff that it's storing in memory. Maybe that actor will end up having to do some supervision or there will be an error up the supervision hierarchy. Or maybe that actor will push down some dangerous work onto its children, its child actors, who maybe will then push down that work onto more child actors. And we can break down the work into those smaller pieces. So one message coming in from some actor reference somewhere across a transport into our actor's mailbox, and then we're acting on that message. And this gives us some great advantages that we'll talk about in a little bit. So in a 
when we think about faults or dealing with faults or errors, I have a diagram here um, that sort of loosely represents what maybe an object hierarchy might look like in .NET. So say we have a service, maybe there's a business logic layer for that service, you know, maybe there's some sort of data access that maybe talks to entity framework that maybe deals with an entity. So we have this sort of hierarchy. And, and what happens when things go wrong? Well, if you're anything like me, you get an exception and you say, I wish I'd written better exception handling for that. And uh, I think a lot of developers have that story as well. And so sometimes those exceptions will just you know, bubble up the stack and you'll find an error and you won't necessarily be able to recover or that particular operation will fail. And you'll have to have some other system waiting to recover something that goes wrong. So this is where the error kernel pattern comes into play. So the error kernel pattern is that idea, as I mentioned, of there's a user hierarchy and there's a system hierarchy. And everything we do in Aka.net lives under that user hierarchy. And so no matter what, even if my actor fails all the way up the chain, the Aka.net system itself can still recover from that failure all the way up the chain. And we can interact with it and make sure that we don't have to say, um, restart a whole service. Right, uh, every, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced where a Windows service they'd written had gone down and it's still running, it just can't process anything. And so it's essentially dead in the water. With the error kernel model, we're able to prevent a lot of that kind of situation from happening because the idea is that we have the supervision strategy. So there are two potential supervision strategies. Well, there are several that come out of the box with Aka.net. Two of the most common are the one-for-one -one supervisor and the all-for-one -one supervisor. So in this graphic here, if the one-for-one -one is, if we have this element all the way down the left and uh, through the user hierarchy, we have that A1 actor, and then we have a B1 actor, which is the child of that A1 actor. If its child blows up, this one-for-one -one supervisor might say, you know what, go ahead and restart that C1 actor and then process again. And then we'll still handle the response and send it back up the hierarchy through the A1 actor. Or it may be like on the right-hand side that when that C actor fails, that C3 actor uh, fails on the right-hand side, the parent says, you know what, restart all my child actors because this kind of fault is actually something where I need to make sure that all of my child actors are in the appropriate state. And so this is built into the construction of the B1 and B3 actors that you see highlighted in green. Each of those defines a supervision strategy. The nice thing about this is that you're building that supervision strategy at development time because all of the actors have the potential for these supervision strategies. And so there's fault tolerance or this idea of fault tolerance as you're constructing this system. The other thing that's important to note about this sort of strategy and approach is that each of these actors is pushing dangerous work down into a child actor. And so the idea is that you want to push your dangerous work lower and lower and lower in the hierarchy because then you get more and more and more chances to recover should something go wrong. So that hierarchy and that error kernel pattern is very important to resiliency when we think about the actor model. All right, so what are the benefits? That's great. We talked about all these concepts and we've got this, this model and this different way of thinking about development. Like why, why bother? What does it get us? So the first idea, and um, this was really powerful for me once I really understood it, is that actors and everything are async by default. The framework is handling the asynchronicity of actors. Now, what that means is that I don't have to be a perfect asynchronous programmer because I don't know about you, but I'm not a perfect asynchronous programmer. I have trouble building things sometimes where I'll forget some minor facet and then there will be some weird threading issue that happens in my application. One of the nice things about Aka.net is that you're processing a message as it comes in. You can make any changes to the object in a synchronous fashion because on the outside of things, Aka.net is handling the asynchronicity of like how those messages get delivered and how the next one comes in. So it as a framework is making certain guarantees. And that means that I don't have to worry about working with a concurrent list or a concurrent dictionary within my actor system. I can use a regular old list or dictionary because only one operation is happening on that at a time. And so it removes a lot of the overhead about thinking about how to structure your programs in an asynchronous fashion. That's not to say you don't ever need asynchronous code within the actor model, but the idea is that you can avoid a lot of it. And as a result, you can more easily reason about the kind of asynchronous operations that your code has. 
Recoverability, we talked about the error kernel quite a bit. The idea is that you have many, many chances to recover all the way up the actor hierarchy until you get to that top user level actor. And so throughout the entire process, if you continually push work, dangerous work down into child actors, then what you have is this system where you can recover very quickly and oftentimes in a transparent way to the user. And that's what we talk about when we think about that self-healing system. Actors are cheap. Um, that's not a joke or disparaging on actors who are human beings, but the actor model, actors are extremely inexpensive to host. I wanna say, and I'm gonna get this number wrong because it was in my notes and they're not on my screen right now. Believe that last time I checked, you could fit roughly a million actors into a gig of RAM. So there are different patterns here um, because actors themselves are very small and they're usually not holding a ton of state. So in general, if you're processing these messages and moving things around, it's actually not taking up so many resources. So you can get a lot of, a lot of bang for your buck in terms of where these systems live and how they operate, um, because those actors themselves are not very expensive in terms of resources. We also mentioned that, they don't, that the actor model, the actors don't pull. And if they're not, since they're not polling, they're also not creating a lot of that noise where they're checking for issues. So an actor sits idle in your system unless it is processing a message that has come into its mailbox. And that's a great benefit because you're not then thinking about how to manage a lot of that resourcing because the framework is enabling you to do a lot of that cheaply. This also enables certain design patterns. Um, Pettibridge has, does a great course on the ACA.net design patterns. But one pattern is, for example, an actor per entity. So maybe you've got a thousand people in your database. You might want to actually create a parent actor called people and have all 1,000 people under that parent actor all represented as their own individual actors. You can do that because the actors themselves are relatively inexpensive. And now you've got a sort of in-memory system where you can have a representation of those people. And so, you know, that's not to say you know, there's sort of, certainly some thought and some context around that, but the key is that it, you can get a lot of mileage out of the actor system without taking up a ton of resources. Uh, I mentioned the idea that actors can live in a lot of different places and that we work with an actor based on the I actor ref or a reference to an actor's location. This enables location transparency. What I mean by location transparency is the idea that when I call my brother's cell phone, I don't have to know how to route that call, right? All I have is the reference to my brother's cell phone, his phone number. The framework of the cell phone carrier handles bouncing the calls all the way back and forth to him in Philadelphia, where his phone then rings. And if he decides to take a trip to Massachusetts, I don't have to use a different phone number for him. Right? All I have is that reference to that location and the network, the framework is handling the routing of that from one place to another. So in the actor model, that ends up being a great benefit because I could start with actors that live on one system and then I might expand outward to actors that live on, on 10 systems and I don't have to do, make a lot of changes to my code in order to accommodate that. There's also the concept of easy state machines in Aqua.net actors can change their behavior based on an incoming message. We'll show an example of that, but it's generally called becoming or unbecoming, where I can say, okay, if a message comes in, change the entire behavior of this actor so that when the next message comes in, it does something different. So this enables the concept of state machines and in terms of uh, you know, switches and back offs and things like that, you can do some great things by having your actors change their behavior based on the messages that are coming in. And we'll show a demo of that. Actors and the Okta.net system are highly configurable. This means that to deploy actors or to change where they're deployed or to change the way that the system is thinking about them, many times you can change that with a configuration file change. You can say, instead of one actor, I would like 25 actors to do things in parallel. And you can actually put that right into a configuration file that Okta.net will pick up on. So that means I don't have to go into my code in order to modify how my actors are deployed. All I have to do is configure that. And we'll show an example of that in a little bit as well. So to, to sort of envision this and what it looks like, we can think about the older days. Um, I, I, used, I did a presentation like this originally with Matt Burley and Matt used to say, you know, this is, this is great. The, the 90s want their architecture back, right? So when you had, used to have a, a, not a single core application you know, that lived in one core, 
right? Your old sort of old school architecture, no matter how big of a CPU you had, it wouldn't change the fact that your application was running only in one core of that processor, right? It was only running in that area. So you were severely constrained in terms of what you could do, right? Then came multi-threading, which is awesome. You know, now I can make use of all the cores in a processor and you have to do a little bit of extra work, but C-sharp helps us out a lot with that. But, and now I can take care of multi-threading in my code and I can make use of all of the processor architecture that I have available. Okay. So then we get to the part, however, with scaling out. Okay, so I've, I've, I'm doing multi-threading and I've hit the limit of my eight core processor or my 12 core processor, and I'm maxing out all of those cores with the work that I'm doing. Oh, I need to add another machine into the mix. What normally happens here is you have to reassess your architecture. You have to introduce the idea of message queues, right? Or service buses. You have to figure out a way to talk between systems and to do that in a resilient manner where you're actually able to, uh, to recover if something goes wrong. So we see a lot of service buses and, and queues and, and different infrastructure to help us now that we're traversing across the network between machines, right? So we end up having to make a lot of different choices in our code and introduce new components and do things along those lines to get our system to be responsive in a multi-machine environment. And what Akka.net enables us to do and the actor model enables us to do is the idea that scaling up and scaling out are the same thing. If I write an actor and I want to deploy it to another system, I can do that with a configuration change and create a cluster where both of those machines talk together and I don't have to change the actual actor model or the actual behavior of my actors. I just write an actor that gets deployed somewhere and does something and knows how to get references to other actors. And the framework helps us do that. This was particularly uh, fun the first time I saw it in action. And so we'll demo that today and hopefully some of you will find it fun as well. Speaking of which, I think it is time for demos. Um, so Kevin, I'm not sure if folks have had questions at this point, but as we transition to the demo environment, I'm happy to hear any questions that folks have. There was a one discussion point. Um, regard, so you were talking about the asynchronous model uh, with the actors. Mm -hmm. uh, someone asked, um, is there anything that works in a multi-threaded environment or is that a, a different, different idea altogether? Sure, and so the idea, that's a great question. The idea here is that the actor model itself and the Akka.net framework are doing everything asynchronously for you in terms of passing messages into actors and sending those messages out to other actors. And so within your actor that you build, you don't have to worry about asynchronicity. The idea here is that maybe if you have a large operation that normally you would do in a multi-threaded way, you break that operation into different parts with different messages and you push each of those steps down into a child actor. And so you're getting the asynchronicity by passing messages back and forth, rather than having to do async and multi-threading yourself in the space of that particular actor's operation. So Akka.net and the actor model is sort of async by default in that you can treat your operation synchronously, but they're happening in the whole actor system asynchronously. And Akka is handling the threading and the tooling for that for you behind the scenes and abstracting that away a little bit. Um, does that answer the question, do you think, Kevin? Uh, we're on a little bit of a delay, but okay. he said yes, yes, or she okay. said yes. Sorry. Great. Happy to hear it. So what we'll do now is we'll get into some demos, which is always my favorite part of a talk. And I was telling Kevin that I actually retooled some of these demos to enable a, an example that I think helps drive home the point of some cool things you can do with the actor model. So hopefully that will work today, but if not, it will be the joys of live coding and I'll bounce back to the old version. So let's first look at, and I'll make sure I'm, I'll check with you, Kevin, is this zoomed in enough to be visible on the screen for folks? That looks good on my screen and okay. probably will just look better um, on everyone else's. Okay. Gotcha. So I will, I'll go ahead and try and keep things to, to this level of Zoom. So I have a program here. And the first program that we're going to demo is a simple hello, oops, a simple hello world application. So the idea here in our hello world application, and I'll introduce the structure first before we see it in action. So here, it's just a simple console program. And I have a 
the first line here is that I use Aqua.net to create an actor system. So one thing I'll note is that generally speaking, you create a lot of actors within a system, but you don't tend to create a lot of actor systems. Actor systems themselves are expensive. You tend to have one actor system per process or one actor system per deployed thing. So in this case, for this sample, I'm creating an actor system called Hello World System. Then what I'm doing is I'm creating an actor by saying system.actorof. So this is how we create actors in Aqua.net. We don't say new actor because every actor is created within the context. So in this case, what this is saying is create an actor underneath that system. So a top level actor underneath that actor system hierarchy. And what we're doing here is we're passing in a hello world actor. Now we'll talk about props and what those do in a second. But the idea here is that those props are telling Aqua.net how to create a Hello World actor. And in this case, there's really nothing that it needs to do to create a Hello World actor, it's sort of the equivalent of saying new Hello World actor. And we're giving it a name here as well. And that's that name that's going to live in that Aqua.net address. And the name in this case is Hello World actor. And then I have a sort of infinite loop below where I say, enter your name. And whatever name someone enters, uh, if it doesn't equal the word end, I tell the hello world actor, um, or I tell if it doesn't equal end, I tell the hello world actor a new hello world message that passes in the name. So now we'll look at the hello world actor itself and how it's structured and how it handles that message. First off, I'll look, I'll look at the message itself. This is that immutable message that we were talking about earlier, the idea of immutable messages. So our hello world message is a plain old C-sharp class that takes in the string name and sets a read-only property called name. So this message only has one property. And I can't change it after it's been created, right? It's just, it's one-time creation and then everything else can read from that property. Similarly, I have a finished message that I can pass along. This finished message is just an empty message. There's really no properties, it is the, the the idea of the message is in the name of the message itself. So I don't need to add any additional information. So if I go to the hello world actor here, hit F12 and go into my hello world actor class. Couple of things to notice. The first is that it inherits from the idea of a receive actor. This is what gives us access to things like the actor's mailbox or to the idea of sending messages elsewhere. It adds, it's a base class that adds a lot of the actor functionality here. So most actors in the actor systems that I write tend to inherit from receive actor, which has some of that basic stuff built in. You can also inherit from some more basic uh, or lower level types of actors that have some greater functionality, but you know, it's not all built in for you. So most of my actors tend to be based on receive actors. We can see here that there is a property or a, you know, a member variable rather call that is an I actor ref. So it's gonna to refer to another actor somewhere. And this is a console, this is named console writer. So what we do here is whenever we create the hello world actor, I create a child actor underneath it. So we did system.actor of previously, this receive actor base class gives us this property called context. So I can say context.actor of. So that will create an actor underneath my hello world actor. And that's of type console writer actor. As you can guess, that console writer actor's job is to write a message to the console. So in the constructor for the hello world actor, we set up how we should respond to incoming messages. So in the case of this hello world actor, when we receive a hello world message, I can pass the message in. And then I tell my child actor, a new write something message. As you can see, I got very fancy with my message descriptions. And the write something message is just a string, but it will take that hello world message and pass along the name property of that message. And lastly, we, tell, we can tell the console writer where this message is coming from. And in this case, we say it's coming from ourself. It's coming from that hello world actor itself. So we'll take a look at what the console writer does with that in a second. Similarly, if the hello world actor receives that finished message, the one with no properties at all on it, it tells the console writer to write a message that just says, I guess we're done here. And so let's look at the console writer actor, just we've got the full picture in our heads here. The console writer actor very similarly inherits from receive actor. When it receives a write something message, it writes the line 
here in brackets, it tells us what the path of the sender is. So we can see where that's coming from in our actor system. And then it writes out the message, which is that thing to write that gets passed along as part of the write something message. So let's go ahead and fire that up and see, see how that works. I'm gonna go ahead and build this project real quick. So I can't remember what I did before. And you know what, let's go ahead and, and just go ahead and I'll hit F5. And we'll hit F5. There we go. And we'll run. We'll run this. Uh, we'll run this project. So again, as I mentioned, just a console app. We can see enter our name. So I'll enter my name, Sean. Now, when I hit enter, it's going to create that um, that hello message, which will talk to the console writer and create the write something message. And so when I hit enter, we see that the actor at user slash hello world actor says hello, Sean. So I can enter it for Kevin. I can enter it for a Swift gig. So we can see those there. And as we saw earlier, if I hit end, it'll send that finished message. So I go ahead and I send that message. And we can see here that it happened asynchronously. I exited that loop, which printed out finished, press any key to exit. And then after that, asynchronously, my hello world actor, that console writer actor wrote stuff out to the console. So that's a quick example of how actors can pass around messages and those messages, you know, can, and actors can do things in response to receiving those messages. So next up, I have a demonstration of the idea, let me just double check. I have a demonstration of the idea of become and unbecome. So let's look at that example next. I'll close everything else. So again, another console application to demonstrate this. Oops, wrong one. Actually, I'm sorry, I copied the wrong file. So you're gonna give me one second here. I'm gonna pull up a file for my other example because that's really funny that that happened. Okay, we'll go ahead and copy that there and replace it. That looks better. So this is what happens when you do demos just before a talk. So in this example, for our become and unbecome demo, what we're going to do is create another actor system. In this case, we'll call it un become unbecome demo. And then we're gonna create another actor under that hierarchy. And in this case, the, the actor is named a variable console writer actor. Then I'll talk about in a second, we'll show what that actually does. So what it's going to do is we'll write a little message to the console that says, say some things. And then while true, we'll take whatever text uh, we'll take whatever text comes in from that console, and I will tell the variable writer a new write something message. Just that same write something message with a string of text that we used in our other example. So if I go into the actor itself, what we can see here is a little, it's a little bit different than what we had before. On one hand, we still have a receive actor here. On the other hand, we have this idea of I with unbounded stash. And that's so that we can stash messages to retrieve them later. So the way this works is that when we first create the variable console writer actor, it's going to become a normal writer. And that's the, the kind of behavior that it has. So now we have this, this method here. And that says, whenever I receive a write something message, if the message is of the text, be quiet, it writes out a message and then it changes its behavior for the next incoming message. And it'll stash all those messages and it won't write them out to the console. Otherwise, it will write things out to the console. And now when it becomes quiet writer here, you can see below, we now say, okay, when you're in quiet writer mode, whenever you receive that write something message, if it isn't the phrase be loud, you stash it. If it is the phrase be loud, you, it's, you write out letting it all out and then it unstashes all of those messages that it had stored and then it becomes a normal writer. So what happens is it basically will fill up its mailbox again with all of those messages that we had stashed for later and then it'll become a normal writer which will then start to receive those messages. So let, let's look at that in action and see, see what it does. Oops, I got to build the project again because it was the old program. Still not what I'm trying to do here. So that's okay. We may have to scrap it and that's fine. 
But the idea here, and if I have to, I can go ahead and uh, I should be able to rewrite that as well. Okay, become, become, build that. Go ahead and debug it. It's showing the other example that I'm gonna show you in a minute. So I didn't wanna show you that twice. All right, let's go ahead and see if we can run an instance of that. If not, I can still show you in the older version of the code. Okay, so here we go. Here's the example. So it says some things. So we'll say, uh, hello, and it echoes it. World echoes it. And then we can say, be quiet. And we can see zipping my lips. And now I'll type in hello. I'll type in world. I'll type in, you know, Swift kick is amazing. I'll type in Kevin is awesome. And note, it's not echoing those things back. So when I type be loud into the console, we can see letting it all out, it puts those messages back into the mailbox and then it processes them all normally. So that's an example of how become and unbecome can change an actor's behavior while it's running and give you some more of that, that great responsiveness in terms of how you might wanna structure something. The next thing I will show is the idea of supervision. And then lastly, we'll talk about routing and how, and that's where some of the real power lies, Nako.net. So supervision and hierarchies, we talked about this. So in our demo for supervision, it's getting a little more complex now. So I'll, I'll go through it. We create an actor system, again, another console application in this case, call, we create a supervision system, actor system. We then create a parent actor and we give it the name parent actor and we pass in our props to create a parent actor. And we then, uh, in this case, I'm not actually even using the console writer actor. What we do is then for numbers one through 100, we tell the parent actor to process that number. We send a new process a number message with the number in it. So there's nothing up the sleeves of that process number message. It just takes in the number and then you can refer to that number in a read only way. So it passes, so it's gonna put 100 messages in the parent actor's mailbox to tell it to process a number. So let's look at what that parent actor actually does. So that parent actor here, you can see, oops, you can see it, it inherits from receive actor, so it's the same as the other ones. In our constructor for the parent actor, we create a child actor. And in this case, it's called a volatile child actor, and that's because it's gonna, it's gonna occasionally throw some exceptions, and we'll see that in a minute. So we create that underneath our parent actor here. And whenever we receive the process a number message, all we do is tell that message, that same message to our volatile, ch to our volatile child. We also have a supervisor strategy here defined in our parent actor. And this is, this is related to that child actor that we're creating. And currently we have a new one for one strategy that says when one of my children, one of my child actors has an exception or blows up, what do we wanna do? What behavior do we want? In this case, to start off with, we're gonna stop the child actor and it won't be able to process any more messages. So let's look at the volatile child actor and then we'll kick this off and see what the behavior is. Okay, so the volatile child actor here also has a stash here, but we'll get to that in a moment because that's how we're gonna to start to recover from some of these errors. We have an actor selection here. An actor selection is a way to sort of get a child actor or a console writer actor by the location in which it resides. So we know that there's this top level console writer actor that we created earlier, and it's going to find that by address. And I'm just demonstrating another way that you can find an actor. So it finds an actor via its address and that's um, its reference there is the actor selection. So our volatile child actor, when it receives the process a number message, if the number of process, now you note here, we have a private member variable, right? Not an asynchronous anything, right? Not a concurrent anything, just an int in a private variable called process numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if process numbers, if we've processed six numbers so far, it resets the counter and it throws an exception that says, I already processed six numbers. I'm too tired to process this number. And then it'll tell the console writer, 
um, otherwise, if it doesn't throw that exception, it'll write out to the console writer that is processing that number. And that's all it does. And then for every message it receives, it increments the number of, of numbers that it has processed. So that's a local variable, right? So there's, it's not concurrent. We're only processing one message at a time. And it'll increment that value if it doesn't throw this exception. So let's go ahead and kick off that program to see what the, what the first, um, you know, what, what happens by default. So I'll start that console program. And don't worry, it'll throw an exception in a second. And so it, we see the exception was thrown. I already processed six numbers. I'm too tired to process number seven. I'll go ahead and hit continue. And let's look at some of our output here. What we can see it here is that it processed numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. I can see that this actor threw an error in my, in my console logging. And now we can see that it stopped that actor. And now none of these messages were delivered because that actor is now dead. It's, it's stopped. And so we can see that there are dead letters that were encountered. So all of you know, so none of those other messages were delivered or processed. Well, that's not great, right? Because basically there's one exception and now we're totally hosed. So what we'll do instead, what we could do instead is in our parent actor, we'll update our supervisor strategy. So instead of directive.stop, we can use a couple of, we can have some other choices here. We can resume processing, which ignores the error and says, I don't care and just takes the next message. We can restart the actor, which will recreate it using those props, set it into that default state and then go ahead. So let's look at what resume would look like. And for those of you who are following, you can bet that this might not be the, the, uh, the solution to our problem. So I imagine what will happen here is that we still won't process those numbers and we'll still have that error, uh, you know, we'll still have the error going forward. I already processed six numbers, but we're resuming. And so it still can't process those, the next batch of numbers either. Okay, so it, it does reset that, all right, because I we threw the exception. And so it's still hitting that error. So let's go ahead instead and change that directive in our parent actor to a restart. So it'll restart that, which will reset the counter. And then we should be able to recover a little bit better, but not perfectly. And we'll, we'll look at what's happening here. OK, let's go ahead and run that. What we see here, OK, we've got, we've got that issue. And then we're going to restart the actor. OK, so we still get these exceptions. I'll go all the way through. I guess you probably can shorten the number from 100 to something else. But go ahead and hit continue again. All right, now it wrote out all of this stuff. Let's go ahead and scroll up to the top. So we can see it processed one, two, three, four, five, six, but not seven. It didn't process that at all. So it still skipped it, but we were still able to process all of those other numbers, right? And we still saw the errors when it went through the errors, but we're still able to keep processing. So some of our stuff still succeeded. It's only those other numbers, the numbers where it had the exceptions that it didn't process. So let's go ahead and see if we can make that a little more resilient then. So what we'll do here is in our volatile child actor, <clears throat> I have some commented code here. Now remember I mentioned that actor life cycle that we have. What we can do here is in our pre-restart, so that's before an actor is restarted, we can stash the current message, which means we'll be able to try it again previously. And then after a restart, we'll dump that message back into the queue, okay, or into the mailbox rather. And so our parent actor doesn't need to change. It's still restarting the child actor. We'll go ahead and build this and talk about what it's gonna do. Okay. So we'll still see the exceptions, right? Cause there's still, the exception is still happening. So we'll go through this again and we'll look at the behavior and what the result was. Now, in this case, we're seeing the exception because I'm explicitly throwing it and not catching it because I wanted to see it happen here. But go ahead and finish that. OK, so let's scroll up to the top again. We can see here process numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's going all the way through, and it is processing those numbers. So we can see here, for example, there was an issue processing number 56. 
or no, so we can see the, the uh, exception that was coming through a little bit asynchronously. I already processed six numbers. I'm too tired to process number seven, but we can see here that we actually did, were able to process number seven. It's just the messages themselves are coming a little bit out of order. So too tired to process number 13, and yet we see that we did process number 13. Right? So even though it was blowing up, it was restarting and it was pulling those uh, numbers in. And it's hard to tell with the console and the, the, uh, the coloring, but it did actually complete processing all of those numbers, even though there were exceptions being thrown throughout the way, because we built a supervisory strategy that, that worked for what our need was at the time. And so supervision is that powerful concept where we can keep the system resilient and processing things that we want and what without, um, and we can build that in sort of at development time so that at runtime things will be more resilient. And the last set of demos that I have today around routing, um, because it's sort of my favorite thing to demonstrate about the actor model. So we have a couple of scenarios that we have here. What I will ask you to do is ignore this configuration. I had to put it here for the sake of this demo and it actually, I'll explain it in a little bit. So for now, we're gonna skip past it. We have an actor system in this console that we are creating called Elastic System. We have a, in that Elastic System, we're creating another top level actor. In this case, I have aptly named it Demo Actor. We're giving it the name Demo Actor. We're telling it a message called Start Demo, which is a message, another one of those blank messages that just the name of the message is everything it needs to be. So we'll tell the Demo Actor to start the demo and then we'll wait till it's finished. So let's look at this demo actor and what it's doing. So again, it inherits from receive actor and we've got two actor references here, a random number actor and our, our trusty console writer actor again. So here I'm gonna describe different ways to create that child actor, that random number actor. So here we're gonna start off by creating just a single child actor. Um, and it's a, a, an actor called the random number after random time worker. And I'll explain that, that purpose in a second. So we create that single child underneath this parent actor, underneath this demo actor, and we call it workers. Now, even though I'm only creating one right now, I'm putting it at an address called workers. And it's because we'll expand on this in a little bit. We, so we create our random number actor child. We create our console writer actor child. We dump some messages to the, the console directly. And then what we say is whenever I receive a start demo message. I'll tell the console writer to write out starting demo. And then I've got this great system or feature of aqua.net where I'm using a scheduler that's built into the context. And I'm saying, okay, system.scheduler.tell repeatedly. So it's not gonna wait any amount of time to start. It'll start right away sending these messages. And then every one second, it's gonna send a message to the random number actor. And the message will be called generate random number. So we're gonna send it a sort of command to generate a random number. So every second, it's gonna dump one of these messages into the mailbox of that child actor. So let's look at the child actor just to make sure we've got a handle on what it's doing. We've got, it's a random number after random time worker. So what it's going to do is it's going to generate a new random number and then it's gonna wait for a number of seconds between one and 10. Note that we're straight up calling thread.sleep here. We're putting that thread to sleep. And then we are generating the random number and then we're writing it out to the console. So this is to simulate doing some work. So we're gonna get one of these messages every second into the mailbox and we're gonna process them at a variable length of time. And so let's just look at that by default with one child here and see, see how that's working. And there'll be some outputs when this starts. So don't worry about that either. Starting some remoting, don't worry about that. We'll talk about that in a moment. So you can see, I've been told to generate a random number. It took five seconds. So it's still dumping a message every second here. So right now this actor probably has 20 messages in its mailbox. You can see it's still waiting. I've been told to generate. It's taking quite a long time. It took seven seconds that time. So we're still getting messages in the mailbox, right? So the idea is here, it, we're a little slow with our throughput. Our child actor has taken a bunch of time and it's got a bunch of stuff queuing up in its mailbox. So let's see how we might fix that. So in our demo actor here, the first time we created just a single actor. Now, instead of that, we're gonna put that actor 
behind a router. A router is a concept within Aka.net. So what we'll say here is instead of creating that single router, we're going to create, again, the same random number after random time worker. But now we're going to add this code to create a new router. In this case, we're creating a round robin pool where messages will be put into the actor's mailboxes one by one in order and in a round robin fashion. But we're still only going to have one worker in here. So it's sort of like a group with only one member. So let's just, we'll output that. Let's look at what, let's look at what that is doing here. So the, the console application will look a little different. So now we can see that this addressing has changed. We see there's a dollar sign A. Aka.net has generated a name for this worker just to be a, a member of this pool. So it still has an address. It's just been automatically system generated. So that's one worker. So we're not getting any more throughput than we had before. It just happens to be a part of a group, but there's still only one in it. So what about if we were to instead change that from one to 10. We'll go ahead and build that. And now what we'll see is a number of those child actors get created in that pool. And we can see A has been told, B has been told, C has been told. So it's delivering those messages in a round robin fashion. And we can see that those actors are starting to process these things asynchronously. And we're actually getting a lot more work completed because we're now doing 10 of those operations in parallel. And all I had to do there was change not my actor, not the code behind it. But when I created those props, I just said, and by the way, create a router for me and make 10 of them. Right, so with that simple recipe, I'm able to increase the throughput of my application you know, by 10 times. And so we can also do routers from configuration. And that's where I think this is pretty awesome. So we have, we create here the same, instead of our, our router that's hard coded, we'll create a random number after random time worker and we'll use the configuration instance. So that's this text up here that I was ignoring before that we'll talk about now. Normally it's in an app config file, but for the purposes of today, I have it in a little text variable. So I have a section here. This is basically Hokan, which is um, human oriented configuration object notation, I think is what it's called. Um, it's essentially a little bit like JSON on steroids. Um, and the idea here is that we had, we're defining our Akka deployment properties. Now here I have some things commented. So let's say that whenever the actor at demo actor slash workers is called, I'd like a round robin pool with 25 instances. And don't worry about that remote attribute yet. Right? So now in configuration, I'm saying whenever an actor is created at demo actor slash workers, create a round robin pool with 25 instances. So we'll go ahead and build that and watch what we do here. Let's see if that works. So here's starting the remote again. We can see it's creating A, B, C, D, E, F, and it should go a little further now. Yep, G, H, I. So we can see here that it is creating 25 child actors there, and they're all getting those messages one a second, right, in a round robin fashion. And Akadanet has all sorts of strategies built in out of the box. You could say, uh, deliver the messages to the actor that has the least number of messages in its mailbox already, for example. So you can do some cool stuff like that, but I like the round robin as for demo purposes. Okay, so that, now we've just updated the deployment of our actors via configuration. We didn't have to change anything about our code even, we just had to adapt one configuration variable there, which I think is, is pretty awesome. But lastly, what I want to show is the idea of remote actors and Aka.remote. This is where you really start to get into the power of the actor system. So what I've got here is I've got an application that I'm calling Blank Slate. The Blank Slate application, it has some configuration again that I had to kind of break into here for demo purposes. And what it's saying is that it is going to live at port 9001 on localhost. And all it does is it creates a blank slate actor system and it sits there doing its thing. 
That is all it does. Note, I'm not instantiating any actors. I'm not doing anything with this system. In my demo actor, what I am saying, oops, uh, my demo actors configuration, what I'm saying is whenever demo actor slash workers is called, not only do I want to create 25 actors, I want to create them over there on the other actor system running inside of that other process. So I'm defining where those remote actors should be created. I'd like to create it, remember, localhost 9001, which is where that blank slate application is listening, and on the actor system named blank slate. So here we can see that I'm the, the, uh, the demo actor system is sitting on port 8091, and it's trying to contact this blank slate at 9001. So let's look at that in reality. I'm going to open that blank slate application. And you know, I'm feeling a little bold just sitting here doing my thing. So we want to demonstrate communicating through different processes. But I'm going to go one step further. This is a .NET Core application. So one of the benefits of .NET Core is that it's cross-platform. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up, in my case, um, Ubuntu running on Windows subsystem, uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. And I have, I have added um, .NET Core to this Ubuntu instance. So I've got my Ubuntu instance. So this is Linux running on my Windows machine, which I absolutely love. Um, what a cool thing. What a fun time to be a developer. And then I'm going to go to my C drive. And I'm going to go to uh, users. Now I'll go to my username. I'll just kind of find my code, you know, just where, where it has been. Um, presentations, Akka, code.net core. All right, so I'm in Linux now. I'm looking at this. So this is the same code that we're looking at before. And I'm going to go ahead and go into my routing application. All right, so this is where it is. I'm going to go ahead and do .NET run. So what's going to happen here, just to, to set the stage a little bit, is the remote app, the demo actor system is going to run here. And it's going to deploy those 25 actors into this process that's already running, that has no idea about those actors. Remember, we didn't create any actors. We just have an actor system sitting there waiting for you to do something. So it's actually going to go ahead and deploy those actors all the way across that boundary into that other process running on a different OS inside my machine. So let's just see if that works. Imagine it'll take a second. It always takes a little longer than you think it will when you're demoing. So here it's running, starting, remoting. We see starting the demo, but nothing is nothing is happening, right? In the demo screen. And that's because behind the scenes, Akka.net has deployed a remote actor with a router and 25 child actors into that other process running across OS boundaries there on my machine. And so because of that, I haven't had to change anything about my actor system in terms of the code. All I've changed is a configuration about where to put stuff and added Akka.remoting. And so this is a very powerful concept when you think about building distributed applications that are doing work across multiple machines. And in fact, Akka has some stuff built on top of this that makes that even easier. But this is one of my favorite demos to show because the first time I saw it, I was like, what do you mean you can create something that deploys a whole system of work to another process running somewhere else. I loved the idea of being able to do that in a safe and reliable and easy way that, uh, that is also incredibly fast and resilient. And so that for me is some of the major benefits of Akka.net. You know, but we've only just begun. So on top of that remoting demonstration that you've seen, Akka.net has built in some additional libraries. So first off, everything we saw today was in memory, right? So if we were operating a long running operation and the power got pulled on our server, right? That wouldn't have been great, right? We wouldn't have been able to recover. But Akka includes the idea of Akka.persistence, which will let you use a SQL Server database or a Cassandra database, or um, I believe MongoDB as well to serve as a persistence layer for Akka, which is to say the actor system won't act on a message until it's been persisted to a database. 
And at that point, you can actually snapshot messages and replay them and retry them if things go wrong. So there's a whole persistence layer that you can build on top of it. Akka also has Akka.cluster, um, which is sort of the remote capability you saw there, but in a much more advanced way, where I can create a cluster of worker services that know how to sync up with each other, know how to talk to each other, and know how to distribute a workload amongst themselves for that kind of distributed processing at scale. And so you can do some great things there. You can also uh, use Akka.net for streaming operations. So if I want to stream a bunch of data through to my actors, I can do that as well. And it has the ability to, for example, um, I want to utilize uh, as much of my system as possible until my CPU hits 80%. And then I want to slow down the number of messages that I'm accepting and back off a little bit. Akka has those kind of op operations as well. So when you're thinking about things like ETL operations or massive operations where you know you might tax out the limits of your machine, Akka streaming can help you understand that back off and understand a little bit about how to work with that and work within those constraints as well. So if you're interested in more about Akka.net, one of the things I love about them is that they've got a very vibrant open source community that's very accepting of pull requests. I just submitted a pull request last night for Akka Persistence MongoDB to allow um, some new syntax that Aaron had asked about. And it's a very quick, easy process. They're happy to educate you about the concepts or getting into things. So I highly encourage you, especially since this is a Hacktoberfest now, I highly encourage you to check out the Akka.net GitHub repository or to check out petabridge.com for the bootcamp or Rogers site, nethouse.se. And the website for Akka is at getakka.net. And that's got great documentation and samples and different ways of configuring things. So it's a very vibrant um, ecosystem. It's a great opportunity to build responsive, resilient applications for your users. And so I'm excited to have introduced you to this and get you started on your journey with the actor model on Akka.net. And I'm happy to take any questions or to connect with you uh, on online after this. So that, that's all I got for today, Kev. All right, well, welcome back everyone my videos should be coming up um share right see, we had no other questions there was uh some conversation about localhost whether or not it bridges the same um same localhost and windows versus um wsl sure and, and um, honestly for this for the sake of this demo that may be the case um i think the next step of this demo now that i've got it on donet core is probably to throw a demo up where i'm running on a linux box on azure or something like that yeah um, but you certainly can bridge across OS, across that, assuming that you have the, the capability to connect on the network, you can certainly bridge across different machines as well. Very nice. All right, and that was, uh, that was about it. So we are on a little bit of a delay, but um, so I'll tell you what, we'll actually, I'll stop the recording and okay. we'll hang out for a minute or two afterwards if anyone has any questions. So Sean, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thanks and for having me. I learned a ton. That was actually really useful stuff. Um, I, I have probably half a dozen use cases that I might <laughs> try to go um, implement it in, or at least try to do some more research and and figure it out on my own. But we really appreciate you hanging out with us today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's always nice that I don't get to do enough of these webinars and with it's something that's got a great community like the Swift Kick Show. It's really, really nice to, to be able to come on. So thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, everyone on live stream, just hang tight. We'll be right back and watching this afterwards. Take care. And we're off. All right, cool. All right. Yeah, that went really well. So uh, good number of folks um, throughout the session. I was watching the numbers go up. I nice. think we maxed out around 10, um, but I won't get the final. It doesn't calculate all the numbers um, until afterwards, and then it sends me a report. Um, cool. So, well, yeah, I'm happy to do it. Like I said, live. We're, it's, we're just it's not one recording. 10 or 100 is, is fine with me. So. Yeah, yeah. So that went really well. Um, cool. So, yeah, so we're still, we, I know we're still live. Um, folks are saying in the chat, you're still live. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know. That's the point. <laughs> you're on hot mic, hot mic. Don't say things. Yeah. yeah. Oh, how about all those people in chat? Holy crap. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that went very well. Um, I don't see anyone else asking questions. So we'll okay. just go ahead and call it a day for Friday. I'm thinking Sounds about just, just closing up shop today and, 
not uh, not a bad idea. I've got I've got a little bit of a blog post to write, and I'll I'll probably do the same. But it was wonderful to get to close out the week with you, and it's a really nice to to get to connect with the community. And I, I really appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, definitely. And I'll see you at Tech Bash in yes. a couple of weeks. Um, I don't think I'm coming. I'm not going to be there for workshop day. Um, I'm coming up on was it the 12th? So the first okay. day of Tech Bash. My son. I'm bringing my one of my sons with me. Awesome. Um, That's great. So they, they say they're going to do a whole bunch of kid stuff on Friday. And yeah. I'm like, all right, well, I don't know what that See, means. Have, they have a lot of activities, I think, throughout for families because the Kalahari is such a family-oriented resort. But I think they yeah. really try to make it a, a family-friendly event, which I think is amazing. I'm really glad that they do that. So, were, cool. you, were you there last year as well? I'm trying to remember. I wasn't there last year. I was there the year before. Okay. Um, I... I started instituting this policy where I don't want to speak at the same conference more than um, I saw that Respect. once every two years Respect. I like uh, that. because there's been so many things I've had to say no to because it conflicts with something else. So the mm -hmm. easiest way to combat that is don't say yes to the things I did last year or the year before. Yeah. Keep it, keep um, it fixed up. I like so, that. Like there, and there's so many, there's so many good local events like um, code camps, like so many mm -hmm. code camps I've missed yeah. just because the code camp announces three weeks before it happens and the events I commit to um, announce yep. six months beforehand. Exactly. Um, so. Yeah, no, I think it's a good, I think it's a good strategy. It's one, when I saw you, uh, I saw you tweet about that and I was like, that's what I'm probably going to adopt too. I, I like that the way that that's set up. I think as I think about planning stuff for 2020, I think that's a really, yeah. a really nice way to approach it. So thanks for that tip. Yeah, definitely. I also like do more international stuff. Um, I've never done internet. Well, I've done, I've done uh, coder cruises. So that's as international as I've gotten, but gotcha. it's always when the international stuff pops up, I'm already, I'm already committed mm -hmm. to something else. So it's really hard to plan around those schedules. So. And I know my 2020 is probably gonna be a little limited given that there will be a, an infant on, on hand, but uh, yeah. you know, I'm sure that'll probably be a, you know, a little limiting there, which is, which is fine. Um, but I think the idea of then, yeah, I'm going to do something, do something new or again, yeah, international as well. I've been looking at NBC yeah. and I've been looking at or dev and thinking, you know, I should, I should really submit to those things. Like I always, for whatever reason, I love talking. I love conferences. I never quite get the gumption to like submit to an international conference. Yeah. Where, all of my developer heroes are, are giving talks, you know, and it's just for whatever reason, I've, I put that, that mental barrier there. So I think it's, it's time to knock that down for sure. Yeah, definitely. It's a, uh, you, you, they'll definitely say no, if you don't submit, <laughs> <laughs> there you um, it's uh, the rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. And so good luck with the little one. Well, I'll see you before that happens, but yes. um, good luck with the little one when he or she comes. Mm -hmm. um, definitely take a break around that time. Inside oh, that. I intend to. I yeah. Excel has got a great leave policy and I, I intend to utilize it. So Very cool. Yeah. All righty. All right. Well, have a great weekend. Thanks again for having me. You too, Sean. I will talk to you later and bye to everyone that's still watching us. Thanks everyone for joining today. Really appreciate it. All right. Take care, All right. Sean. Take care. Bye-bye.